Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you guys for joining us um, on a very special night, very special 9-11 evening. We have a terrific cast of poets that will be introduced to you in one second. And um, just want to thank all you guys for being with us for the last two and a half years and maybe more in smartphone theater. We'll still have some more. There's some formatting things that are changing. But uh, um, again, thank you guys. It's It's been such a pleasure um, creating for you and uh, both in plays and in poetry and in conversations, more to come. Uh, but we wanted to take this time and just say thank you. My name is Todd Felderstein, I'm the founder and um, one of the directors and the producer of the, the whole shebang. So uh, I'm enormously grateful for you guys uh, and your continuing to, to visit us and hopefully enjoy everything that we provide. All right, without further ado, I want to introduce Devin O'Brien who put this whole evening together. So Devin, come on on. Great. Thank you, Devin. Devin, I'm going to hand over the reins to you, and I will see everybody at the end. We're going to do a, a short Q&A at, at the, the very end. Um, but know that we have all of our poets who are going to be um, speaking. And then at the very end, we have a, a poem that's written by Devin. So again, here we go. And Devin, you take it over from here. Thank you. Got it. Thank you, Todd. Welcome to Smartphone Theater and this special edition of our poetry series for today, the 21st anniversary of the, nine, of the attacks of 9-11, we chose the subject of civic matters. In my Webster's, there are three definitions for civic. One, appropriate to a citizen, as in civic virtue. Two, pertaining to a city or other municipality, as in civic life. Three, relating to citizenship, a member of society, as civic wisdom. Poets get a bad rap. Sometimes people think of us as self-involved or frivolous folk. Well, maybe that's true, but we are citizens of communities and cities. We are members of society with the unique ability and therefore some responsibility to express our civic concerns. And given the date and the state of the world, we have invited poets to compose poems on civic matters that matter to them or to answer the question, where were you on 9-11? On that day, we pledge to never forget. Today, my fellow poets keep that promise and we will all, um, they will join me in a reading of my poem, which answers that question, 9-11 in LA. Now, I would like to welcome and introduce our poets. First, beginning with Michael Cavanaugh. Michael, would you come on out? Ruth Lerdahl, David Selby, Smokey Miles, Kevin Kelly, Shirley Snyderman, Joseph Walsh, and Donald Norman. Our first poet, I'd like to introduce Michael Cavanaugh. Civic Matters. The name of my piece tonight is called The Rise and Fall. Ah, uh, the many matters. What can these matters be? Yes, there are many many very easy to see. Should it really matter what the matters are today? Some, actually many, say this or that matter doesn't matter anyway. But are there really serious matters? Are there serious matters that really do matter? Does one matter matter more than another matter? Are there one or more matters we should consider and contemplate? cogitate upon and mull. Are there other matters? Not so much. Is one matter a major matter? Another a minor matter? Sort of like baseball, major leagues, minor leagues. A big deal matter, a little deal matter, a no deal matter. Who decides the size of the matter? Big, little, or none at all. Who makes that call? This matter is a really big deal or not. Perhaps that's a call that each of us has to make for him or herself. 
And is it possible that that call might go something like this? What are the matters that matter to me? Now I'm a mild to moderately intelligent bloke and there are some matters that do matter to me. And to me, they are no joke. The matters of climate change and global warming matter to me. Glaciers disappearing into the sea matter to me. Shorelines disappearing, covered by this new sea matter to me. More drought, less water, those matters matter to me. Record high scorching temperatures and raging fires too. The word monsoon being used where it never was before as unimaginable floods inundate the land. <clears throat> Environmental degradation, vast amounts of deforestation, those matters matter to me. The matter of global overpopulation matters to me. Eight billions, we're told soon there will be. That's too many. That's just too dang many. We couldn't or wouldn't feed all the seven billions or six billions before, and now we go for eight? This is a major matter. But for many of the billions, it doesn't seem to matter. Granted, there are millions for whom these matters and other matters do matter, many millions all around the world. But many millions ain't enough when for many billions, these matters and other matters don't matter at all. In another piece that I wrote in a long ago day, I wrote about the good old US of A and its relations to Rome and Greece and Egypt, even Genghis Khan and all the Khans that followed. I wrote about how those in power during those glory days didn't pay attention to the matters that mattered. And we all know the results of that universal disregard. Those big shot powers are no longer big shot powers. They all fell into that all-consuming fire, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Now, the earlier piece I wrote related to the good old U.S. of A and how it is dangerously close to slipping into the rise and fall of the Roman Empire syndrome still is dangerously close. But now in this piece, about the matters that matter, I say, if the billions keep thinking those matters don't matter, we will all be dangerously close to slipping into an even greater syndrome, the rise and fall of the global empire. <laughs> Never happened, you say. Okay. I don't think you're right, but okay. In the meantime, just in case, when you're in the shower, sing shorter songs, just in case. Thank you. I'm gonna read two poems. The first one is called Watering the Parkway. Water finds the lowest ground, the steepest slope to travel down, disrupting dirt along that route, gathering force, eroding earth to greater width, till that's the way the water flows, all the water from the hose. Thoughts run through the deepest grooves, that look for subtle ways to prove what evidence the mind has found and sureness grows within itself to greater strength till that's the way you're sure to think as if it all were set in ink. Step back from the curb, 
you'll see that when you look beyond downstream, the pools to which those runnels lead swirl with waste and darkness, dust and seeds. Irrigate an unwet place, move on to different ground, feed different roots until the leaves of peace are found. This one is called Gun. You bought a gun to call your own, a signal that your guards had gone. You set to work like other aims, a soccer ball, a video game. The click, click slide of practice loads reverberate a righteous ode, uneasy rest through stucco walls. I can't unhear those protocols. At last, your cash competes. At last, an armory, the hordes to meet. A coated lock, a metal keep, your list complete for dreamless sleep. Thank you. Mud and slush of opinion, prejudice, tradition, delusion, a hard bottom we call reality. We cling to our country as we cling to our mothers, knowing and praying our country will not only survive, but will be a better country. The young will look back at our country's story and will cling tighter than ever to what it stands for. And will take us over the mountain to a place where we will not be apart or afraid. After 9-11, we all looked at life differently. Travails and anxieties, fears of one sort or another, insecurities, cowardice, concerns with self, all after 9-11 seemed insignificant, though no less bothersome. There were other things to think about, real things. I went to bed very late the night of 9-11. Strangely and disturbingly, I slept soundly. Thank you. Well, uh, I apologize. I um, had a strange attack of a uh, dyslexia and I I heard the assignment wrong uh, so when I heard civics matter uh, uh, civic matters I thought it was about civets so this is called civets matter and uh, if you don't know what a civet is I did a lot of research so this thing is a little distasteful in some ways but it's all reality a civet's a small lean mostly nocturnal mammal native to tropical Asia and Africa, especially the tropical forests. The term civet applies to over a dozen different species, mostly from the family Viveridae. Most of the species diversity is found in Southeast Asia. The best known species is the African civet, Civitectus civilla, which historically has been the main species from which a musky scent used in perfumery also referred to 
as civet was obtained. And they often call them civet cats, but here I will explain. The civet cat is not a cat, it's more like a mongoose. But if you see it being brash going through your trash, you'll know that a civet's on the loose. Now I wonder why it's called a cat when it's really just a civet. I suppose someone called it that and no one ever came around to pivot. It lives in Africa and Asia, but can be found in North America as well because people bring them over here enchanted by their smell. They make this crude, buttery yellow taste that turns a bit darker with age. At full strength, it smells nauseating and fecal, but when diluted, it's the rage. A radiant, velvety, floral scent that smooths out the rough patches. It adds the bloom to fine perfumes, which from their perineal gland, man catches. It's a potent secretion made by both civet woman and man who live alone in tiny cages from dusk to dusk. And every few days, some human hands squeeze their perineal glands in the process of harvesting their musk. They're not happy, those poor civets. They get injured all the time. And keeping them in those minuscule cages could be considered a crime. They've got short little legs long bodies and long tails, and some of them are striped like they're in prison suits in jail. It's the sack next to the civet's anus, which is what has come to pain us, for now we know exactly how they get milked. It's a dirty, rotten business, but perfume makes a great gift for Christmas. And besides, people even eat the stuff that's spilt. Let me give you an example. How about that civet absolute, which adds flavors like rum, butter, and caramel to sweets and cigarettes, too. Those civets roam wild in some places and rub their paste upon the trees to attract their mates from miles around. Oh, mama, it brings them to their knees. Then there is the Kopi Luwak, the most expensive coffee in the world. It can be 90 bucks a cup, having been run through the guts of civet boys and girls. They grow them in Indonesia. They feed them coffee cherry fruits. They can't digest the coffee beans. They poop them out. There is no substitute. If some, someone pooped out some coffee beans, just like those fabulous civets, would you wash them up and brew a cup? And then would you go and sip it? Ooh. Or would you only let a civet plop out your coffee beans because they taste much better than the ones from human beings? Would you poop like a civet and make the output trays expensive, celebrate with a nice Glen Livet, and not go on the defensive? You do like to drink coffee. You do like to smell good. And by using that poor civet, you just knew that you would. Those Asian palm civets eat banana, mango, papaya. Some civets eat meat like chicken or rat or whatever they desire. Some people do eat civets. That wouldn't be my choice, but they say their meat is gamey, and when it's cooked right, it is moist. Some civets gets ro get roasted and toasted for a meal. In o Ethiopia, they get squeezed for musk. Do you wonder how that feels? Civet musk has been described as sweaty taints with some dripping fecal batter. It is what it is. It ain't what it ain't. But for sure, yes, civets matter. Thank you, Jamil. How you doing? My name's Kevin Kelly. How you doing? How you doing? My name's Kevin Kelly. The song called uh, Everything's Turning to Stone. I have heard the story told by fool and wise men, young and old, everything's turning to stone. Black or white or rich or poor don't seem to matter to me anymore. Everything's turning to stone. Bombs falls, walls collapse under the rubble, nothing's left. Everything's turning to stone. I look around and all I see is the greed of a global economy. 
everything's turning to stone. Well, as the fires were blazing, the man said next to me, are you a man of anger or are you a man of peace? I said, brother, I ain't sure no more. All I know is this, everything's turning to stone. I met a woman, she broke my heart. Now I ain't quite sure where I'm gonna start again. Everything's turning to stone. I guess someday they'll bury me. Then I'll finally get the chance to see if everything's turning to stone. That's called, uh, this is called, it's all good. Big man breaks his back working into the night. I watch him in the marketplace. One hell of a powerful sight. I said, mister, I don't want to get in your way. I <laughs> just got to get me some milk. He said, don't you worry about nothing at all because it's all good. On a bench, I sit waiting for the bus next to a mother and a son. Little boy points across the street at a rag man looking for his lunch. Little boy say, mama, why is that man looking like Jesus? Why is he in that garbage can? Mama say, there before the grace of God go I, son, and it's all good. 3,000 people in that terrible crash. Can't make no sense, can't make no sense, can't make no sense of all that. We all want the mystery because we can feel the weight. Heavy hearts on long winds blow and blow and blow and blow and blow and blow. I visit my friend Russ lying there in a hospital bed. He's just killing time, fighting off the spirit of death. I say, God damn man, this disease, it just ain't fair. He says, come on, k dog, you got some life. So you better do some living now, cause it's all good. I right, one more poem I'm gonna read called Our Final Cause. And then I'm gonna get out of here and you'll never have to see me ever again. Uh, <clears throat> the time we share together is brief and sometimes hard. Yet the wisdom of the ages hears the unheard call from the heroes now forgotten from the saints who live to bear the burden of humanity and the depth in which they cared. In the spring proceeded summer and the summer followed fall. I speak in the first person as the poet speaks his peace for all. Yeah, you philosophers keep on asking why us painters we dare draw as the children of the future sing. What is our final cause? All my life I've been guilty. All my life I've been burned in pursuit of the sunrise, its fall and its return. Yes, my fists have met resistance on the walls that did not move. And the lies that I repeated, baby, they hurt me more than they ever hurt you. And so I make up songs that never play on your radio. I'm here, I'm there, I'm everywhere, I'm nowhere. And now I go. And you philosophers keep on asking why us painters we dare draw as the children of the future sing. What is our final cause? For some of us, it's Allah. For some of us, it's Christ the Lord. For some of us, it's capital gains. For some of us, it's holy war. And those who remain silent, you are digging your own grave. I walked around this world three times. All I found were slaves imposing their own judgment, chained by their own chains, crying mercy, mercy, mercy. Yes, we all create our own pain. Now, I may be dying slowly, but I am not dying dead. Sir, there is no earthly reason why the hungry can't be fed. I will shout up on your rooftops. I will sound all the alarms. I will riot in your streets. I will sound the call to arms if you persecute the lonely, the wretched, the outcast. Have we not learned the lessons of our father's father's past to love and love and love and love and yes, to love some more. I hear the future generations chanting, what does our life stand for? Now you philosophers keep on asking, why us painters we dare draw? as the children of the future sing, what is our final cause? Thank you.
My piece is called Scream. Two months after 9-11, 2001, I found myself in New York City. My mom was turning 90 years old and I wanted to be there. Living in Los Angeles meant I had to get on a plane. With terror in my heart, I flew white knuckled with fear, sat motionless for five hours, cities below and clouds above. The party was a big success. The grandkids came, my brother as well, friends and cousins joined in the celebration. She was so pleased. For a few hours, we forgot about the carnage just a few miles away. We found joy and togetherness and talked about everything with ease. It was the right thing to do. Her smile was everything. A few days later, we knew we needed to pay respect and visit downtown. We stopped by the firehouse. Many of the firemen from that house had perished two months before. And then walked the streets near the fallen buildings, reading notes with photos posted on a board. Have you seen my son? This is my daughter. Her name is Jamie. Please call me if you have any information. And another note read, my husband was in the Twin Towers that day. Did you know him? Did you see him? All the joy of the previous days were erased by just walking a few blocks near the fallen buildings. The following morning at our hotel, I sat in the lobby sipping my second cup of coffee. I was reflecting on the joy and the sorrow of the last few days. Suddenly, a ruckus arose. Everyone was standing in front of the lobby TV. American Airlines flight 587 has crashed in Queens. There were 260 passengers and crew on board. There were no survivors, the reporter repeated, repeated. Dead silence, nobody moved, nobody spoke. I'm still in disbelief at what happened next. I stood, stood up, I looked at the TV and screamed. I am not getting on another plane. I am not getting on another plane. The rest of the day was a blur. Did the people in the plane that flew into the tower scream or did they accept their fate? And those who jumped out of buildings so as not to be burnt alive, did they scream as they were falling? Hopefully they passed out before their bodies lay lifeless and broken on the rubble below. Did the wife who later learned that her husband was in one of the towers and the mother who just put her son on a plane to go back to college, did they scream? Did the teacher of the second grade elementary school in Sarasota, Florida scream when she learned why President Bush left the classroom so abruptly? And those across the Hudson River in New Jersey who watched the planes crash and the buildings come down, did they scream? Did they stand motionless in disbelief? over and over and over again. The police, the firemen, the mayor, the reporters could not find answers, no relief. And the Pentagon and, and the field in Pennsylvania, how to exist and stay alive even in the mania. The patients were too busy trying to stop the plane from crashing. They did not have time to scream. The next day we packed our suitcases, paid our bill and left the hotel. We rented a car and drove all the way back to Los Angeles in silence. Thank you. Um, this is called a civic obligation. A man sits at a table outside a cafe. Another man walks by. The man at the table stops him. Excuse me, yes. Would it be too much trouble for you to sit here with me? Here? Yes, I'd rather not appear to be alone. I don't mind being alone. It's just the appearance. I see, well, we wouldn't have to talk. There'd be no obligation other than proximity. And this would be helping you? It would. Have you asked for this service before? I haven't. Why now? I suppose something came over me a need for a stranger's company, a need to not get to know someone, yet to have them near, to not look into their eyes, but to know that they are there with no use other than to be near, as alien and comforting as space. It's not a difficult job. 
I've never shied away from a challenge. You'll have the benefit of being able to ignore someone without the fear of hurting their feelings. No talking, no understanding, no acknowledging, no sympathy or patience. Yet we're talking now, simply setting the terms. And my time would be my own to do with what I will entirely. And we would be free to not know each other. It's implicit in the arrangement. I could order coffee, check my messages. I prefer that you refrain from using your phone. I think I could manage that. Then it's settled. Yes. Thank you. My poem is called uh, Drive Through the Desert. I'm driving through the desert seeking home. Small mountains jut singly and suddenly from undramatic plains. You can see their shaping from seas and wind, from asteroids plunging through the atmosphere a 50,000 year moment ago, and from the slow, steady march of continents. Time captured in panorama. I wonder if this unpeopled landscape is home. I live amongst people, but I don't know why so many live on the streets between empty houses. I live in a city, one not yet lost to flood or fire, yet still there is a sense of dissolution, of edges crumbling away. I live in the most advanced of technological wonders, yet new diseases are like barbarians at our undefended gates. And our technologies have, rec have created too many experts too much hubris. I live in a system supposed free, but I don't know what my rights are today. They've changed since yesterday and the highest bidder seems to be hoarding them all. Country once seemed like home and I slip along the borders uh, of this, uh, I, slip, I slip along inside these arbitrary boundaries, but I no longer feel welcome in a nation that no longer welcomes. My planet feels like home, but how much longer? She takes care of herself. She'll be fine. A few thousand extinctions are nothing new and I'm nothing special to her. My body is a home, but I pour unliving things into it day by day, chemicides and petroleum methyl citrates in the clothes I wear, the air I breathe, the water I drink. How long before my body withdraws its welcome? I keep driving through the desert toward the ocean. Perhaps that prehistoric home will welcome me back. Thank you. Thank you, poets. And now um, the poets will join me in a reading of my poem called 9-11 in LA. It reminded me of the War of the Worlds, that <clears throat> old and infamous broadcast by Wells, what I heard when I first turned the radio on around 8 a.m., having left my son for the fourth day of the seventh grade at his school in LA in Laurel Canyon. On our way there, streaming along the streets, I marveled at the lessened traffic while my son sneaked a nap in the back. What time is it? He'd perked up when I turned into campus. 12 of eight, I answered. 
By then in New York, there were no World Trade Towers, and in Virginia, the Pentagon was in flames. But I didn't know then when I pulled in for the drive-in and the drop-off. I heard a girl say, Mom, I want to go home. I attributed it to some teen trouble I was not yet called upon to cope with. I said, I love you. I said, goodbye. And he said, yeah, he waved and walked away. At the wheel, I tried to imagine why the girl who had just arrived wanted to go home. Then, switching the radio on, I heard the swirl of sirens, breathless, frantic talk about people whose skin was coming off, people on fire leaping from towers, city canyons overtaken with smoke, talk of how quickly the towers came down. What, I wondered, was it? And was it real? So all the planes go into the towers, said George, calling us at home from Mexico, where he, the world, already was watching. Well, you've seen it. I hadn't. No, no. I said, no, go on. Oh, that moment, like something in a movie. No, no, it's not fair to compare this to a movie. But the horror the terror of Tuesday were of such a scale and of such a scope only Hollywood had prepared us for. I tuned in, I turned on, I spent the day with CNN and the BBC, with MSNBC and KPCC, collecting quotes and images. Here they are. Our fellow citizens are and our freedom has come under attack today. Joe, you're muted. An American Airlines jet has lost 150 people aboard. The president cut short his trip to Sarasota, Florida. He is on his way to Washington. How did the CIA not know about this? But how many of these have we broken up? There's a new thing out there, asymmetric warfare. It put the hole in the USS coal. It made the embassies in Africa explode. It's about precision and secrecy. This is the day of extreme terrorism, the attacks get geometrically worse. Twin Towers World Trade Center collapse after crash of two airlines. Would you call this an act of war? United Airlines reports a plane missing. Three weeks ago in London, Peter said on CNN, there were warnings, whisperings of a huge and unprecedented attack on the US, on us. Someone there said, Osama bin Laden said with a smile, the victory of Yemen will continue. How could this happen to the safest country on earth? Any country which shelters or harbors terrorists responsible for this attack is functionally capable of the, event, of the events that took place today. The man in charge of security at Logan Airport fields questions from the press about Logan Airport. It's not morning to him. It's like midnight. He's grim at Logan. He could not confirm. He would not deny. I ask my husband to drive, get our child. I want him home with us. I, I want him home. Nothing like this has happened in U.S. history. This has been compared to Pearl Harbor. The president is in Louisiana. Welcome, shown over a video phone. The man of the Taliban is shown live from far off Afghanistan. Now he waits for translations before he can answer. He seems to be sitting. He seems to sway. Bin Laden is incapable of this, the spokesman for the Taliban says. He shows neither shock, concern, nor surprise. In the metal rim of his glasses, there's a white light trapped. It slides to the left, gleams. It seems to scream. 
then it glides to the right. We need more human intelligence capabilities, intelligence that determines motivations before acts occur. I don't think our lifestyles are gonna be the same for a long time. President is at a secure site in the Midwest. When my son comes home, I get out ice cream. We are grave while the blender cuts and whirs. We are grave while he drinks the milkshake. We've never made a milkshake in the morning. A plane flies overhead, he looks alarmed. I smile, I say, everything is all right. I think of the mothers in I think of the mothers in London's blitz. How did those mothers watch the children play balls or marbles while waiting for bombs? I say to my son, on Pearl Harbor Day, your grandfather worked at the Chronicle in San Francisco at the city desk. He wrote the lead for the paper that day. As my son sips, I can tell he's impressed. Airline crashes in Somerset, Pennsylvania. This is a fluid situation. It's changing all the time. The U.S. is a unique power, a uniquely open country, and we are uniquely vulnerable. And now the president will speak to us. He walks into a room somewhere, maybe Louisiana, perhaps Nebraska, only there's no audio. The picture breaks up, looking like something by Hockney. In New York today, the Twin Towers fell. In Virginia, the Pentagon's in flames. A plane that may have been bound for Camp David came down in a field in Pennsylvania. It is a day of unnatural visions. The towers of steel, aluminum and glass converted in an instant into flames, a gas that pursued people down the streets, crouching by carbs, by curbs, where they could. It coated the living with dust, with ash, a video camera, trembles, records, frantic shadows pursued, hunted by smoke. The smoke is systematic, democratic. It skips no floors while wordless, wondering, motionless and trembling and appalled spectators on a corner. Watch the smoke burst downwards, floor by floor by floor. This is the sort of thing that makes us rethink everything. Can you describe what you saw there, Mr. Mayor? The most horrific scene I have seen in my life. Says Rudolph W. Giuliani, the mayor of New York. He went downtown when the first tower was hit by a plane he and his aides were trapped in a building nearby at 75 Barclay Street. Our thoughts are first for the enormous loss of life, the loss of firefighters and police officers alone. He stopped. The mayor of New York could not talk. He started again. And for the tragedy the tragedy going on in lower Manhattan. There are 170 hospitals in New York, all in triage, ready for the stream of ambulances. The Red Cross will be setting up stations for blood donations. New York City is on heightened alert. New York City is secure. Everything is safe right now in New York City. New York City is closed. Everybody in their own way should say a prayer. Said the mayor. The mayor, the governor and their men answer questions. What is, what is the composition of the smoke? What is the radius of the damage? How many casualties do you expect? While these words are seen, they scroll on a screen. 50,000 people worked in the World Trade Center. Each of the World Trade Center towers were 100 and had 104 floors and 21,800 windows. The towers were built by the Port Authority of New Jersey and New York. 
Tower One was completed in 1972 and Tower Two in 1973. The number of casualties will be more than any of us can bear, said the mayor. 53 injuries reported at the Pentagon after a plane hit the west side of the building. For security reasons, the Secret Service doesn't want the president in Washington. How could this happen to the most secure of secure buildings? No one can stop us, our freedom and our way of life. The New York primary is suspended. The ballparks are closed. The UN's empty. Trains New York bound are told to turn around. A sign on the drive nearby New York reads, serious problems, avoid New York. Congress is evacuated. US airspace is closed. International flights are diverted to Canada. All planes in the air are ordered land anywhere. Both Disneyland and Disney World are closed. And at the White House, there's nobody home. Yeah, we should retaliate, but who are we going to hit? Who are you going to go to war with? I mean, we don't even know who we're fighting. Get the president to the White House. Send a message. Has anyone taken responsibility for this? There is a street in the Middle East where people cheer when they hear the news. They wave from their cars, honk and celebrate. An old woman does a dance. Little boys wave little flags. Children are given sweets. When they hear, some men grin from ear to ear. This is a sweet, says one, from Osama bin Laden. We have a report that there are good indications that people associated with Osama bin Laden are responsible for the attacks. It was a complex plan carried out by many and at multiple airports. The terrorists took over the cockpits. Surely they knew what they were doing. They knew to fly a plane, to make it hit a target, a tower, the Pentagon. Surely they knew what they were doing. They chose planes for their flammability. Few think of the normal people in those claims. I'm sure there were teenagers and babies that suffered tremendous terrorism. Those people knew that something horrible had come into their lives and they knew it for a long time. Make no mistake, we will hunt you down. We will hunt down and punish those responsible. The first plane penetrates the North Tower at 8.48 a.m. in New York. In Los Angeles, we were asleep then. The second plane flies into the South Tower at 9.03 a.m. in New York. In Los Angeles, we were asleep then. When the third plane hit the Pentagon in Virginia at 9.45 a.m., I was awake and so was my son. He was in the bath. I was making bacon. As we sat down to eat, the South Tower came down on the street. The Pentagon fell as I suggested jam. The fourth plane crashed when he said, no. Then we got up to go. Around the time that the North Tower fell, I found my son in his room. It was dark. He was in a chair doing something there. You're going to be late, I said, hurry up. It fell when he snapped a school binder shut. It all seemed the same the day the world changed, changed utterly. We will do what is necessary to protect Americans. During our breakfast, a fax had come in. I heard the ring, but I didn't hear it. I didn't read it. I thought, it's just some cell phone deal, some dot-com liquidation. Later, I saw it. I read it. It said, tragedy on the East Coast. But make no mistake. We will show the world, we will pass this test. In New York today, the Twin Towers fell. In Virginia, the Pentagon's in flames. A plane that may have been bound for Camp David came down in a field in Pennsylvania. Thank you, poets. Hi.
right, so I'm going to jump in. Thank you all for a wonderful evening, wonderful readings from the top to the bottom. So thank you guys so much. Um, I am going to open it up. If anybody in our house, uh, I'm really happy to see that we had a, a good audience tonight, both here and on YouTube. So if anybody wants to ask a question, share their thoughts on this particular um, day, I do have, here we go, Cheryl, I'm going to, Cheryl, Cheryl Storm. So just on YouTube, there you go. Hi, um, I remember 9-11 uh, when I was working at a hardware store and our first thought was some idiot in a private plane didn't know what he was doing or was drunk or we just couldn't fathom a big plane going into it and it was a state of shock the rest of the day the uh, owners of the store turned to uh, the local news channel so we could listen to the coverage for like days afterwards and my daughter is 10 going on 11 at that point and I had she had heard about it at school but I had to tell her that her cousin who was 10 years older than her might be having to go over there and the look on her face when she knew that Nick was going to have to go overseas Luckily, he made it back both times and everything, but it definitely changed our lives. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, it's just so hard to comprehend anything else have, happening like that. You know, our, the thing that we remember where we were at, you know, like when we were kids and Kennedy was shot, everybody knew who, where they were. And this is our Kennedy being shot, basically. Exactly. And uh, I want to say thank you again to David for talking to me last March. It was, about two weeks before my birthday, best early birthday present I ever got. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you for sharing and, and tuning in. Great. Uh, anybody else have any other thoughts, questions with the poets? And uh, Devin, uh, let me just ask you before our night's over. Um, when did you write the poem at the end? Uh, and but it was the it was it nine twelve that you actually sat down or? <laughs> I started at that morning at nine eleven and collected the quotes all day and was writing it as as was writing it nine eleven. I mean, I began on nine eleven. I was probably done a week later, so I worked mm -hmm. on it. Great, wonderful, thank you. Um, Kevin, you your pieces as well. Your were, did you uh, your song and so forth? Were you were you uh, the moment the nine eleven occurred? Were, yeah, yeah I was sitting in front of the TV the whole time with my guitar and just kind of just kind of went from the C chord to the A minor, C chord to the A minor, then went to the F, and then I just I just wrote the uh, the, uh, the verse, and then um, and then I don't know that that. that the next morning, I think I wrote the chorus. Wow, amazing. And um, yeah, and then I recorded the song and then I recorded it again. And uh, this was nice. I mean, I never, you know, I never sang a cappella before. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Is you. your song out here? Is it out there? Is yeah, it you can go to uh, um, kevinkellymusic.com there you go you can, you, you can hear everything's turning to stone it's all good Beautiful. and uh, what was the other one? Oh yeah and in, down, down in Tompkins square park you have our final pause so awesome. my stuff is out there all right cool Just keep thanks, pointing buddy. in the right direction thanks 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 um diane diane glickman you are live yes thank you very much you brought it back to me that day i was driving my kids to school I live in LA. They were going to Paul Revere and to Palisades High School. And then I had to go and teach at Palms Middle School. I was, I was a special education teacher and the kids I had 11 to 13. And uh, really, uh, you just took me to that day. I was, you know, they didn't let us turn on the TV at school. They, they wanted us to, uh, they just kind of announced it, but um, and then every year after that, and I taught till 2017. So the ones I was teaching later didn't even know about 9-11. I had a Times book with all the pictures and your recording should be in the schools because you have brought it alive again, everything you've said. So I hope that you will present this to uh, history teachers and in LAUSD because it's, it's very real what you said. 
And thank you. Thank you, Dan. And and if you have, you know, we we do make it accessible. I mean, it will be accessible shortly online. But if you have someone in mind, you know, feel free just to shoot me a note, and I, I'm always happy to reach out and share the work. So, you yeah, said I, you said it's on YouTube, so you need to send me what that is. Sure. Yeah. Well, so you, uh, Smartphone Theater has a YouTube channel, so it's just Smartphone Theater. At the moment, you go into YouTube. And, um, and we have lots of playlists and this one will be attached to the, the poetry playlist. Okay. But um, um, so we have the live stream that's gonna go up automatically, but there's gonna be a, another version that I tweak a little bit that'll go up probably by the end of the week. Okay. okay. But feel free to reach out to me at Todd at Smartphone Theater. So, um, you know, and then we can take it to the next step. Okay. Thank you for suggesting it very much. Yes, thank you, Diane. I just wanted to say, Todd, thank you for creating this venue of Smartphone Theater, which has nourished poets and playwrights and actors and given us an opportunity during lockdown to work together and be together and to be in people's living rooms or, you know, kitchens or houses and to share our work throughout. And I, I hope people are donating <laughs> to Smartphone Theater, making donations, click on that and uh, send Todd some funds to keep this going. And also, I just wanted to say, gosh, you poets, you were wonderful. I loved your poems. Um, uh, Smokey, I'll talk to you later. I don't know why you didn't consult me, but um, you know, anyway, thank you for that levity in the midst of this. Uh, uh, difficult subject. Uh, you all inspired me, really. So thank Great. You. Thank you, Devin. Thank Devin. Thank you so much for pulling this together. Uh, I really handed you the reins, and you were just beautiful in it, from soup to nuts. So thank you. Uh, you really, you know, nine eleven. Um, you brought the the essence and the the what was necessary in telling the story. So thank you so so much. Uh, you know, it's six o'clock or a couple minutes of. If anyone else wants to chime in, please do now. Otherwise, um, you know, check your emails. And I'm looking at the attendee list and we have people from, from on both coasts. So thank you guys so much, both in here in LA and in New York. I'm, I'm thrilled to see you guys here. And um, again, if you want to reach out, you can reach out, email me, Todd at Smart from Theater, or everybody knows everybody for the most part. And um, all I can say is thank you poets so, so much. Um, I'll, I'll do, we'll still do the wrap up. So I'll send you guys a quick link and, uh, and we'll do a, we'll do a quick post show wrap up. Otherwise, everybody else, thank you guys for tuning in. And yes, Devin mentioned the donation. If you guys want to donate, there's a link on the website, which is smartphonetheater.com. Okay. Again, thank you all very much. Have a, have a wonderful week. Be safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Congratulations you. Congratulations. All. All right. All.